I'm John Haskell, director of the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. Welcome to Kluge Book Conversation. We are here today with Dr. Simon Martin, recently the Kislak Chair in the History and Cultures of the Early Americas at the Library of Congress. Simon is the author of Ancient Maya Politics, a Political Anthropology of the Classic Period, 150 to 900 Christian Era, which he will be discussing with Kluge's Dan Torello. Simon's book was published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. It has won major prizes from the Association of American Publishers, judged to be the best in the category of biological anthropology, ancient history, and archaeology, as well as in the humanities section. It also received the R.R. R. Hawkins Award, which is presented to the most outstanding work among each year's entries. Simon's a political anthropologist and specialist in Maya hieroglyphic writing. He is also associate curator and keeper of the American section at the Penn Museum. That collection includes more than 3,000 rare books, maps, manuscripts, historic documents, artifacts, and works of art related to early American history and the cultures of Florida, the Caribbean, and Mesoamerica. Thanks for joining us, and let me turn the conversation over to Dan Torello. Thank you, John, for that introduction. Simon, great to see you today. Thanks for being here with us. Uh, we heard from John, you've had a storied career. You've spent time all over Central America. You've been on site on archaeological digs. Before we talk about your book and we jump into those uh, conversations, can you tell us a little bit about your personal background? How did you come to Maya politics? Uh, how did that all happen? Um, well, for me, it's a, a, a second career. I got, I got a, another chance in life. Um, I started out um, as a designer and um, did my entire training in art schools. And um, purely the Maya stuff was, was just a hobby and uh, something that I just had on the back burner that I would dabble with um, every now and then. And steadily, as time went by, it just became more of an obsession. And uh, so um, latterly, and when we're talking about the 80s now, um, it just got bigger and bigger. And I started reading more material, which allowed me to start writing material, um, going to conferences, meeting people, going into the field. And then I just kind of, you know, segued into it. Thanks, Simon. So as I understand it, one of the storylines in Maya studies has been the quest to decipher uh, Maya glyphs and the, so the Maya system of writing. In way of context, can you tell us, can you give us a few snapshots of what the key moments have been along the way and where that leaves us now? Yeah, well, Maya civilization was pretty much unknown until the 19th century. Um, at that time, people recognized that there were a lot of hieroglyphs on, on monuments, but uh, they were completely impenetrable. Uh, in the later 19th century, um, people worked out the number system and the calendrical system, and they were able to read the dates. Uh, and that was a, like a framework that everything was um, hitched onto. Um, but beyond that, uh, actually deciphering any meaning became um, a dead end and um, no one really made much headway all the way through the 20th century. In fact, um, people essentially came to the conclusion that it was unreadable, um, either because the kind of co the key to it was entirely lost, or, you know, actually it wasn't really about anything serious anyway. It was all, you know, it's a star mythology and also something that only its authors could actually understand. So these misconceptions started to be um, destroyed in the uh, middle of the century, and particularly in 1960, with Tatiana Proskurikov's publication of uh, her historical hypothesis. She, she essentially proved that uh, Maya monuments uh, have kings uh, and queens on them, um, because up until that time, they were thought to be deities and priests. And that uh, each one of these censors had these archaeological sites had a dynastic history, the kings, names, and things like that. Um, and then there's a little bit of a hiatus until the 80s and 90s, when some of the work that had been done back in the 50s, but pretty much ignored, uh, Konorosov's work on phoneticism in Maya writing, 
um, that began to take off. Uh, and a, a few key people got involved who had just preternatural talents uh, for, for looking at things and seeing the patterns. And uh, steadily since then, we've been linking the writing system to language. And so we can read and pronounce and, you know, um, sing these things we really wanted to, um, to a stage now where we've, we've cracked a lot of it. Um, not all of it, um, you know, it's gonna be very, very difficult to understand some very rare signs, but most texts we now understand pretty well. So you were featured in a documentary titled Breaking the, the Maya Code. And, and in this documentary, you tell the story of a uh, Soviet era scholar who kind of accidentally got involved in Maya studies, but then, and made some significant breakthroughs, uh, but then his scholarship was, was relegated and ignored in part because of Cold War uh, issues and geopolitics. It's a fascinating story. Can you tell us a little bit about who this gentleman was, how he got involved and, and his impact on the field? Yeah. Yeah, I mentioned his name briefly, Konorosov. Um, he uh, was ensconced in the Soviet Union. Um, he had no real connection with Maya studies. Uh, in fact, he was a philologist who understood a lot about Egyptian uh, archaeology and Coptic and these kind of things. And he looked at it with an entirely fresh eye. Um, the people who had been working on my writing up until then were essentially non-specialists um, in languages and writing systems. Konorosov had the benefit of, of a wide experience, both with language and writing systems. And he believed that fundamentally anything that's writing can be understood. Now, we had a few clues which uh, the Spanish colonial authorities had left, and those clues had been misunderstood. It's really in nature of the fact the Spanish themselves didn't understand what they were recording. They, didn't, they couldn't comprehend a syllabic, mixed syllabic logographic writing system. And Konorosov worked out the nature of the misunderstanding between uh, the, the Spanish priest and his informant. And he used that to kind of make the first phonetic headway. And as you say, uh, his work was um, not just ignored, I mean, it was dismissed. And uh, it, it was, you know, partly it was Cold War, War politics and partly it was because Konorosov had not really dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. So it was actually kind of um, open to critique. Um, but it was, you know, 20, 30 years before his ideas really paid off. Thank you. So I, so I gather that in one of the views during the early days of Maya scholarship was that the Maya civilization in general was a, a very uh, peaceful, uh, peace-loving society through and through. And this was really the dominant view for a little while and then was, was revised and upended. Can you tell us a, a little bit about that and how that played out? Yeah, um, well, it was the paradigm that, that really ruled all the way through the 30s until um, 1960, until Proskurikov's publication. Um, it was an interesting time. Uh, people uh, of that era had experienced the First World War. Uh, one of the great um, per persons of the field, one of the great scholars, um, Eric Thompson, had fought uh, in the trenches. And there was, I think, a predisposition to look for another kind of society, a society where people were not at each other's throats. Um, and because the Maya had, was so interested in time and so interested in recording time, that that seemed, that was interpreted as essentially their religion and that all the monuments were devoted to this sort of worship of time, um, that there wasn't any warfare, there's virtually no politics, um, and there was also no cities. I mean, that, that's kind of amazing, but um, the ruins were seen as being the kind of like a ceremonial centers where nobody lived. Uh, and in fact, everyone was scattered out in the forest and just came for special ceremonies. The only people who lived in, in the center was the priest. Mm -hmm. But of course, archeology span showed that that just wasn't true, that there's a low density urbanism with hundreds of structures surrounding these big impressive cores. So that was that was very important to dispelling that. But also there was a lot of um, imagery 
a lot of iconography of um, warfare and capture and trampling on victims. And the kind of things we see very much in Egyptian art or Assyrian art. And there had been a kind of almost like a willful suppression of, of not paying attention to that. Um, amazing murals of, of panoramic battle scenes were kind of reinterpreted as kind of like minor raids um, to fit the paradigm. And so, you know, with the archaeology, the new finds in glyphs, the new analysis of imagery, that whole Pacific thing um, fell apart. So we're now moving into the substance of, uh, of your work, Simon, and you've, you've referred to the Maya as a society of kings. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like in a Maya context? Does it resemble in any way what many of us think when we think of kingship in a European and a French or British monarchy? Uh, how does that play out in Maya civilization? Mm. Well, it's, it's really clear that um, the Maya had a, um, a, a kingship system and a, a direct dynastic um, system. So that was established reasonably early on for this Praskorikos work. The problem was to understand how these scores of major cities were organized. What, what was the political structure beyond local government? And um, there became this view, which was came out of a lot of this archeological thinking of the 1960s, that the level of art, the, the kind of cultural attainment uh, you see in Maya culture was so advanced that this could only be produced by state level organizations. And um, at the time, it was understood that states have to have certain sizes, they have to have certain kind of hierarchies of settlements. And the way that panned out was that there would only be four, five, six, seven regional states. And that's how my policies were organized. The problem was that the, the hieroglyphs didn't say that kind of story at all. They uh, were telling us that there were these very small kingdoms. And there wasn't uh, just, you know, there was there was tens, there was scores. There were, ultimately it was well over 100 uh, of these tiny kingdoms. And that led to completely alternate views about the nature of whether those societies were well organized and strong or whether they were fragile. Um, and there was a lot of interesting models from societies, especially from Southeast Asia, where the kind of pomp and circumstance, the great displays, were all ways of masking fragility. And so the idea was that Maya kingdoms didn't get bigger because they were just too weak. And that was how things were when I came into the field, um, that that was the sort of prevailing view. But as more of the glyphs were becoming legible, it suggested that there was actually another way of looking at it. And that uh, other way was really something a lot closer to classical Greece. You have many small little polities, um, but some are more equal than others. And uh, in the same way as Sparta and Athens were territorially really not that, that big, um, but they commanded uh, uh, clients or, uh, you know, on a vast scale in some cases. And this is the source of their wealth, especially in the case of Athens where tribute would be and, and taxes would be sucked into the middle. So this was a, a way of not having integrated large states at the same time as there's a macro political structure. And that was the first part of, um, of the things that uh, uh, I and some other people were working on in the 90s. Um, but that still left some big questions. And the biggest of them was why? Why, why for something like 600 years, did my kingdoms, my polities not expand? Why did they always stay on this small scale? And that was really, that's the, the, the mission of the book. That's what uh, I'm trying to address. And um, I'm doing that by um, dipping into political theory, um, political science things from modern day, um, other, you know, slightly unused theoretical perspectives to understand how that all those kings were interacting. And that led me ultimately to an idea that came out of um, international relations, which was the distinction between a system of states or a society of states. 
And in a system, everyone's aware of each other. They're all making calculations. They're all interacting with each other. But in a society, which is a lot closer to what we see in classical Greece, relations are not just pragmatic. They're also um, cultural and they're also ethical. And so the Maya realm with all these different kings who wore the same clothes, wrote the same glyphs, built the same design of buildings, their, that sense of belonging was incredibly um, strong. And so this idea of a society of kings with certain kind of rules, um, certain kind of conventions um, became um, really appealing and ultimately is the sort of main thrust of the book. In the book, you've also written that monarchy among, I quote, monarchy among the classic Maya is usually characterized as divine kingship. How did the, how did the kings, what mechanisms did they use to justify their connection or, or sanction their connection to the divine? Uh, was there a priestly class involved and how did yeah. that play out? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of these things where it was pretty clear that it's the kings who are doing the big performances. They're the ones who are interacting with the gods. They're the ones who are impersonating gods. Um, the, the, the priestly class are kind of in the background. They're sort of kind of enablers. And also very importantly is there's a particular title carried by kings. Um, and this is modified by the addition of an extra word. So uh, achau is the word for lord, and a kohul achau is a, um, a holy, a sacred lord. And I think people um, initially started looking at this as sort of a divine kingship model, that these were sort of manifestations of gods on earth. And ultimately, again, as we get more into the inscriptions, and we can see that there's this particular word for god, which they never carry, even deceased great ancestral founders are never actually put on a deified level. So they were really holy lords um, and rather than divine. And that holiness was their contact with local patron deities. And uh, again, very much like classical Greece, uh, each one of these polities had their own list of local gods and um, kings were interacting with universal deities but they in particular were interested in those local gods so it was I, I think a lot of that justification for who they were why they were privileged why they had all this power was their ability to intervene with those kinds of deities we've talked about kings we've talked about priests anyone who has watched any kind of royalty show on Netflix knows very, very clearly that marriages have always been a key bargaining chip in international diplomacy, uh, diplomatic relations. You have an entire chapter in your book devoted to, to marriage in, in Maya culture. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, um, uh, I mean, we knew uh, ethno-historically, we knew from comparable cultures, we knew from later societies um, that kings were polygamous. I mean, the actual technical term polygamous uh, in terms of, of, of males taking multiple brides. And we have enough information in the glyphs and in the, the, the iconography to show that that's how it functioned. And, and yet, it's, it's quite interesting to see that when we have these powerful centers they're not very often sending out brides to kind of cement relationships with other kingdoms. And that's really contrary to what you would expect is contrary to most sort of typical um, political science scenarios. Um, but I think there's a reason for that. And the reason is that with these multiple wives, they were balancing different kinds of strategic objective. Um, you know, it, in, in a Christian system where you only have one wife, you, you basically have to put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. But in a, a polygamous system, you can marry local women to shore up your power base, to keep the nobility happy. And you can ally yourself to various other kingdoms, more powerful ones, weaker ones, um, and, and basically create this, this sort of portfolio, if you like, uh, of different political relations. We don't really quite know how many wives they had, um, and that, you know, make, makes a difference. But um, when 
kings are talking, or actually kings are talking about their mothers, is how we discover this. Um, sometimes if it was political in, politically inconvenient, they just simply wouldn't mention it. And that they certainly wouldn't mention that someone came from a polity who maybe was now on, on the down rather than on the up. So um, it's quite intricate, it's quite complex. Um, we're not always told all of the information we need to know, but certainly this, this whole um, plethora of small kingdoms were very, very concerned with marriage. Simon, I, I can't do an interview with you without asking you one question in particular, and you probably have a, a sense of what it's going to be. Uh, I, I quote from the, the Philadelphia Inquirer, which in 2016 wrote, uh, and I quote, in a small cluttered office at the University of Pennsylvania, a bespectacled scholar deciphers the writings of an ancient culture that has enthralled him for decades. This month, his work can be found in an academic journal titled Antiquity. Everything's normal up till here. And oh, by the way, on the tail fin of a 747. Heavy metal called, so Simon Martin, associate curator at Penn's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, obligingly answered. Simon, what's the story behind this? Somehow your epigraphy, I think, ended up on the, on the tail of a 747 jet. Yeah. What was going on? Give us the backstory. Yeah. Well, you often get, in my line of work, strange requests, and um, they can be of all sorts of different kinds. And so almost nothing surprises you anymore. But uh, I got uh, an email from the representatives of Iron Maiden, the heavy metal band. And I, 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 I'm not a heavy metal fan. I, I know who they are, but I didn't know that they have have done a, a, some thematic albums whereby they take an Egyptian theme or, you know, whatever. Um, and this time they wanted to do a Maya themed album, uh, particularly, and not so much with the songs, but with the, the artwork and all the, you know, skulls and things. So they um, hired me to uh, translate the names of the songs into hieroglyphs. Uh, and they were going to then put that, I mean, no one buys CDs anymore, but um, you can buy special little booklets, you know, commemorative things that the real Cognoscenti fans, um, you know, order. So it was, that was the idea that they were doing actually most of this sort of pseudo Maya uh, art, and then they would have real glyphs. And that was that. Was that. I mean, they, it was a, a very printed, very, very small, and um, thank you very much, and, you know, let's move on. And then, to my surprise, they said, um, well, actually, no, we've um, we decided to reuse your clips. And they put them on the tail plane of a 747 uh, next to the, 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 I think it's called Eddie or something, the, 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 the mascot of Iron Maiden. Um, and has been flying um, uh, around the world on, on tour. So it's, it created a lot of uh, press. Um, I, I have to say there's no piece of, single piece of scholarship that has ever generated as much interest uh, with anyone. Um, but it was fun. Um, they, they, they offered me uh, you know, a pass to come backstage in Philadelphia, which I was out of I was out of town. I was actually out of the country, so I, I couldn't make use of that. But um, yeah, it, it, it was fun, and it's it's fun to see that you know glyphs which are you know three or four meters wide or whatever size it ended up. I love this. I love this story, and as you point out in that uh, newspaper article, Iron Maiden is to be commended because they you know they wanted to get it right, and uh, they they came to the best. Uh, expert they could find you in in this case um and uh and that's and that's great uh the 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 flip side is that you know there, there's a whole there's been a whole trend in in pop culture uh, other appropriations have not been as as accurate and we see that in particular for example with notions of time there's been a lot of fascination with maya notions of time uh, cyclical time, the idea of prophecies, even the idea of a specific date for the end of the world. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about this? What has pop culture gotten right about my yeah. notions of time and what have we completely missed the boat on? Yeah, yeah. well, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think it's safe to say that pop culture gets almost nothing right. 
Um, so that should be the baseline here, you know, is whatever you hear about the Maya, it ain't really quite so. Um, they were interested in the year 2020, 2012 by our um, calendar, um, but they never predicted the world would come to an end. Um, there was, there's no Maya prophecies um, that, it's, it's simply a kind of trick of time and certain kinds of large cycles coming to an end. They calculated many, many hundreds of thousands, millions of years into the future. So they certainly didn't think that the world was going to come to an end. Um, in making the kind of lectures that I was at that time, you know, you, 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 you try and see what other people see and you would type Maya into or Maya calendar into Google and the first 50 images are Aztec, um, the Aztec calendar stone. Um, things which are completely temporally, culturally, geographically, everything wise, unconnected to the Maya. So, uh, and this kind of introduces a more serious point, which is that um, the Maya have become um, uh, exoticized. They, they are sort of used um, in, a, in a way which is, uh, engenders interest and, and, and sometimes that's good, um, but also is, can be very disrespectful. Um, one of the questions people always ask is, well, you know, what happened to the Maya, you know? And the answer is they're still there. Um, there are millions of people speaking Maya languages, um, mostly in, or almost exclusively in, in Guatemala and Mexico, a little bit um, in a couple of other countries, well, Belize, um, Honduras, El Salvador. Um, they're still with us and um, they have uh, their own interests in, in the past. And um, I think that uh, sometimes good things can come out of popular culture. Um, you know, I, I, I guess ultimately I became interested in the Maya because of things I saw in popular culture. Um, but we, we have to be a little bit more mindful of what those images are, what those stories are, when people really just want a good story. They don't really want to know what the Maya thought or what the Maya did. Um, and, you know, very often people will sens sensationalize things. Um, you know, parts of Maya history were quite bloody, but then so were many other societies. In fact, just about all societies. So the kind of singling out for some particular gruesome thing um, is, is again part of this sort of pop notion of, of the Maya as being something sort of pliable um, and you can sort of project onto them whatever you like. So as scholars, we're trying to rectify that. We're trying to create a counter narrative and say Maya were complex people, um, an amazing, fascinating civilization. Um, but Maya people are still around. They're, they're speaking those languages. And if we didn't have all the data that comes from modern and colonial documents, then we, we wouldn't be able to read the glyphs. So we owe everyone, well, it's not even owe, it's a question of participating um, and, and joining a, a, a joint endeavor. You know, we, we shouldn't be telling people um, what they should feel about the Maya in terms of their own ancestors. We can only represent the data as we see it. Um, some of it will be picked up by pop culture. Most of it will be ignored. You mentioned this a little bit, but I wonder if you could tell us more about what what regions and countries do do the current or the de descendants of the Maya live in now, and what do those what does that culture look like at present? Yeah, well, it's it's hard to discuss that without talking about the the, the so called collapse. So what I study is up until 900 um, common era. And by then the society that I'm interested in had, had disappeared, um, but it was replaced by another kind of society, which we call the post-classic. Um, but it meant that the a great swath, I mean, the whole central Maya area where all the densest populations used to live was effectively abandoned. I mean, this is where we still have the jungle and this is where we have the overgrown ruins. Um, people after that were concentrated in the highlands of Guatemala and the lowlands, but in the north um, in, in Yucatan. So um, that was the sort of world that the Spanish encountered when, when they arrived. 
Uh, of course, the, the history or the colonial history in Mesoamerica in general, but my area included, is is very unpleasant. Um, of course, the diseases that came in killed huge numbers of people, um, and society was very oppressive um, of the Maya. So um, there's a long history um, of very, very um, unfortunate and um, deadly historical experiences all the way up until very recently. The, 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 the civil war in Guatemala, which didn't end until 1996, uh, killed astonishing numbers of people. Um, and so this is another part of the context in which, in which scholars work today. I wonder, is there a, is there a question that uh, folks typically don't ask? So for example, a question that I haven't covered, but that you think is a, a really important question, what, what would that be? What's, what is not getting attention these days that should be getting attention? Wow, that's a good question, but also an incredibly tough question to answer. Um, you know, you, you're, 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 you're usually fielding certain kinds of questions that come um, after you give talks in particular. One of them is what happened to the mind. The other one is, how do you know you can read the glyphs? Um, and I think a lot of people are quite happy with the idea that you can read Egyptian hieroglyphs or cuneiform writing system, but somehow they really have a problem with um, the fact that we can read Maya glyphs. And um, the reality, um, and, and not asked enough, is, 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 is quite how that system works. Uh, and, and sometimes how we can crack it. Unfortunately, that's kind of a long, complex story which doesn't make kind of short sound bites. Um, but it is a great cultural legacy. I mean, the, the Maya created the most complex writing system used by uh, a human uh, society. I mean, it, it, there may be a few people who, who question that, but I don't think anyone's ever seriously been able to argue otherwise. So it's a, a fascinating cultural artifact in its own right. But then when you add to the fact that it, it's telling you something which is cannot be gained by any other means. This is a, a record of what people thought and did um, 1,500 years ago up to 2,000 years ago. And for the whole of the rest of the Americas, we don't have that. It's mm -hmm. it's. Uh, we have sort of some historical records that go back a couple of hundred years, but in reality, um, there are many very important civilizations which either did not use writing or they have writing which is very rare and very hard to understand. Uh, it's the Maya who had this copious system, um, which was elaborate, but, but also there was lots of it, which allows us to, to look at their past in a way that we will simply never be able to do for most ancient uh, American societies. Mm, wonderful. Thank you. I have one final question for you, Simon, and I, I wonder, uh, you know, how, how is technology, uh, items like LIDAR and other technologies, how are, how are those changing Maya studies? Mm -hmm. And what, what, what's next? What's next for you? Uh, what are you going to be looking into next? Mm. Oh, wow. That's three questions. That's three uh, questions. You can address any any part of that. Uh, and if you don't want to reveal what your next project is, that's that's fine too. But we're I think we're all curious to hear what the what the next uh, pursuit will be. Well, the 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 my archaeology is being revolutionized as we speak um, by the arrival of airborne laser scanning, um, generally called lidar. Um, this is, gives you the ability to um, fly over the rainforest and look through the trees. Um, my archaeology has been um, expensive, time consuming, uh, incredibly unpleasant in, 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 if you're out in the bush um, trying to map settlements or, you know, um, discover monuments or whatever you're doing. LIDAR uh makes allows you to see everything and it and allows you to see everything in greater detail now obviously if things are buried you can't but i mean um buildings uh causeways um water features um canals with uh, and terracing and big defensive features 
these are all um, things that we knew about and we knew on a limited scale. But LIDAR allows us to cover thousands of square kilometers. And it really um, allows us to see a world which is um, under assault in, in terms of the logging and the looting and that kind of thing. But, but in another sense is we have a pristine archaeological landscape. Uh, in, in the central lowlands and this forested area, very few people have lived since, since that time. So the cultural artifacts are all just there. And it's changing our view about complexity. It's changing our view about population levels. It's it's producing some very interesting features. Um, one of the things that we will continue doing is trying to understand the writing system better and better. Um, there are new projects coming along, which will finally be um, systematizing our knowledge of the writing system, but essentially computerizing. Um, one of the other questions that you get asked a lot <clears throat> is, um, uh, do computers aid decipherment? And the answer is no. Um, essentially, up until now, that's not been possible for all sorts of reasons. But I think it was partly because it's the nature of you need a very sophisticated computer system. Um, you need a, almost like an AI kind of thing. Because the glyphs are not, they're not like Egyptian hieroglyphs, which are essentially so standardized that they almost never change. My writing is much more idiosyncratic. It's much more stylistically variable. So um, it's only sort of today that people are producing kind of catalogs of producing ways of analyzing text, which eventually somewhere along the road will give us insights that maybe we, we don't have as individual scholars. So that's something for the future. We don't, we don't have it right now. Um, I carry on being interested in, in these questions um, and, uh, and other ones. I'm, I'm very interested by the, these late changes um, and not necessarily trying to explain the collapse, which are, I think is an incredibly complex um, question, but to certainly to see how things change and to see how politics change and to see who the movers and the shakers are and um, ultimately build part of the um, of the scholarly understanding of the, that phenomenon. Simon, thanks so much for taking the time today for this great conversation. And uh, we hope to see you sometime soon, perhaps in person at the library. Uh, and uh, we look forward to that. So thanks again. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, it's been fun. Thank you. Take care.